joy to be with you. I am so excited. Uh, met your pastor, your campus pastor, Pastor Robert. I've known Pastor Aaron for quite a few years now. <clears throat> we served on Conway of Hope's board together before they recruited me to be full-time with them. So my job is, I'm a church relations director. My job is to hang out with pastors and bless them and say thank you. And this is why. <clears throat> Without the local church, Conway of Hope would be nothing. All we do is partner with local churches so that when your pastor came up here and said, we're in Florida right now, that was God's honest truth. You're in Florida because your partner, Conway of Hope, the trucks went to Florida because you give and you partner with us. Amen. So we want to thank you today. We want to thank you. 21, let me just read some things to you here real quick. Over 465,000 kids were fed every single school day because of Life Church. Over 34,000 women were empowered because of Life Church. Over 23,000 participants in agricultural training because of your church and ministries like this. We responded to 64 disasters last year, 29 program countries, and did 80 community events because of churches like yours. Will you give yourselves a hand? church and we were loud and proud so if you if the more you talk the shorter I go in fact the more amens I hear the better lunch will be so I want to hear from you today in fact look at your neighbor right now and tell them if you wouldn't have come to church today I say it again if you wouldn't have come to church today I would be the best looking person here <laughs> funny just now and say these words say it's in your hand it's in your hand Exodus 4 2 says this then the Lord said to him what is that in your hand God's talking to Moses Moses is a simple man right he's left Egypt he's out there just as a shepherd he's got a stick in his hand and he goes before God and of all the things that God could say God simply says this Moses, what you got? What you got? That's the Hebrew word for what's in your hand. Amen. What's in your hand? God can use anything that you have in your hand. Amen. God doesn't ask you to go get a bunch of things so that he can use those things. God first asks you to use the things that he's already given um, to you. So when we talk about one day to feed the world, we're asking people just like you, don't, don't go out there and get something you don't have. Give from what you do have and watch how God can multiply it and do amazing things all over the world. I want to share a little bit about my journey. So I brought a picture of my family to show you. I think it's, there it is. See that guy in the middle? I'm telling you right now, that guy can have whatever he wants. If he could speak right now, I mean, he, if he wanted a car, if he wanted a pickup truck, if he wanted a trip to our favorite football game, he could go. His name's Josiah Garza. That's my first grandson. And I'm telling you, if you don't have grandkids, you don't have anything. Amen. Everything changes with grandkids. Amen. Everything changes. In fact, grandkids are a reward because of all the H-E-L-L -L the kids put you through. That's Josiah. My kids over there on the left, that's Crystal, my youngest, on the left. My daughter-in-law, Sarah, my son, Anthony, and Cassandra graduated from Oral Roberts University at the same time. Carissa on the right, she's getting her master's degree at North Central. My baby is playing bass right now for North Central University and loving, loving life. I saw all the, all the females up here and your female bass player reminded me of my crystal. Uh, she plays the bass at school. Oh, please, she is the love of my life. Other than my walk with Jesus, there's nothing else that's more important. Amen. Period. So that's, that's my family. But I want to tell you a little bit about my background because I am one of those people that God just simply asked, what's in your hand? I didn't have much to offer God. My parents are from a place called Nuevo Leon, Mexico. Look at your neighbor and say, Mexico. Mexico. That's the way you don't say Mexico. <laughs> say it right, Mexico. Yeah, wow, you guys are awesome. So my parents are from Mexico. They came to this country to work. 
And they didn't come here to, to, to have things, to do things, to build material wealth. They came here to work and take care of their family. They started off in Florida. In fact, some of the places that have been devastated is some of the places they worked. My mom and dad met working the tomato fields in Homestead, Florida. And so they met there. Uh, their families kind of worked together. They, they take a whole tour of the United States. They worked in places like Minnesota and Wisconsin and Nebraska and all that. They got to a place called Washington. And in Washington State, there was enough work that you could work there about nine, ten months a year. Then they'd go to Mexico and go over there because it was cheaper and all of that. So they would take their, their money, go over there, stay there a couple months, then come back and work again. But before I was born, a farmer said, if you stay with me, I'll give you year-round work. And I got to go to school <laughs> full-time because a farmer asked my dad, uh, told my dad he could have a full-time job. So didn't come from much. In fact, I worked in elementary school, in, in middle school, in high school, worked on farms all the time, kind of got education right around it. I would go to night school during high school because that asparagus that you eat, you know, that you like, how many of you like asparagus? I hate it. <laughs> you have no idea what it takes to harvest that stuff. Do you know it grows six inches a day? You cut an asparagus and the next day there's going to be one there that's six inches tall for about three months of the year, two and a half months of the year. So there has to be someone out there harvesting that stuff. There's no truck that can do it. They don't have robots yet. There's literally people out there cutting the asparagus that you had at your restaurant. That was me. That's what I did. And you say, how did you get from that to what you're doing today? God! I'm sharing with your pastor, Pastor Aaron, last night, uh, uh, Jesse Miranda, uh, uh, a man of God, came to my church one time. He was working for the Assemblies of God, and we had some problems in our church. You've never had problems in church. You don't know what I'm talking about. But back in the day, people used to have discussions that would rise up to battles that would rise up to we need somebody to come and intervene. And Jesse Miranda, he was Dr. Jesse Miranda. I didn't know a Mexican could be a doctor. I said, you could actually go and go to school and, and, and have a doctorate? And, and, and the answer was yes. And he looked at me and people never underestimate the power of encouragement. He looked at me when I was 11 years old and he said, young man, where are you going to college? And I'm like, I'm picking apples tomorrow. He would come back when I was 15 and he said, where are you going to college? He didn't ask me if I was going to college. He said, where are you going to college? At 15, he asked me. He came back when I was 18 and he said, I got a scholarship for you. You're going to Bethany University in Santa Cruz, California. I'm going to give you a scholarship. It was only $1,000 a year, but to me, it was a gold mine. Yes. Yes. Right? believed in me. He came to my graduation. When I went to seminary and got two master's degrees, he was there. When I got hooded as a doctor at Florida Theological Seminary, it was him that was there. Amen. How many of you know there is power in someone who believes in something? Amen. And he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. you got to believe in people. Yeah. And you got to believe in what they already have. Don't keep trying to give them more stuff. God will give them more. You just believe in what they can do. So it's all about what's already in your hands. Some of you remember the late, great Ron Cannoli. He would sing a song, If You Could Use Anything, Lord. Yeah. You can use me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Some of you just want to sing it right now. If you yeah. could use anything, Lord, you can use me. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, you can. All the big people are like, what's that? Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you could use anything, Lord, you can use me. Those are the kind of songs that I was hearing when I was young. When God put a call of God on my life, and I would look around and say, man, you could use that guy. He's got money. You could use that guy. He's going to go to school. You could, And God would say, no, if I could use anyone. I can use anyone. Just simply give me what's in your hand. So a, a little guy from Othello, Washington goes on and I go to school. I've had a tremendous journey, worked with young people for years and years. We started a ministry called the National Hispanic Christian Leadership uh, Coalition. Uh, Sam Rodriguez spoke in your church uh, about a year ago. That's, that's one of my best friends. Uh, we did all those things. This year I was in, we had a picture of this, of this uh, 
a school in Uvalde, Texas. I don't know if you've heard of this school. Yes. Yes. Rob Elementary School. So over here on the left-hand bottom is the pastor. We're having an event for Convoy of Hope. We were able to minister to people who are struggling. We were able to make a champion out of a church. Amen. We don't go there saying, hey, we're here. We go there saying the church is here. Yes. And when that truck leaves, the church will stay here. Yes. And we're able to do all those things because we just simply give God what's in our hands. I love the Word of God, don't you? Yes. Book of Mark, and Mark shows us what happens when a life is given to God. You know, the kingdom of God is advanced when the people of God give of who they are and of what they have. i got to say that again. The kingdom of God is advanced when the people of God give of who they are and what they have. Amen. Jesus, Jesus would ultimately give all he had, right? But then he turns around and asks you, just give me what you have. Just give me what you have and watch what happens. So in the book of Mark, Mark lays it all out. John the Baptist comes and prepares the way. Jesus is tempted. Jesus announces good news. The disciples are called. Uh, he casts out demons. He heals Simon's mother-in-law. How many of you want your mother-in-law healed? Man, there's a lot of quiet men in the room. Go, he goes to a solitary place to pray. He heals a man with leprosy. He heals a paralyzed guy that is lowered through a roof. You remember that story? Yeah. He recruits Levi, the tax collector. By chapter 3, crowds are following him. He chooses 12 and separates them to be his disciples who watch all these miracles take place. This is important. They're watching all these miracles take place. At this point, so many people are following him that his family accuses him. Listen to this. His family accuses Jesus of being out of his mind. And the religious people start calling him someone under satanic influence. He then begins to teach parables, the sower on the lamp, and the growing seed, the mustard seed. All the while, his disciples are watching, they're learning, and they're living. Yes. Let me say that again. They're watching... They're learning and they're living. Amen. We still got to do that today as disciples. Amen? Amen? Then on the other side, right, he calms a storm. You remember that story? Calms a storm. It's powerful. All 12 disciples get to watch that, even Judas. They all get to see it. He gets to the other side and there's a demon-possessed man. A demon-possessed man who, who is breaking his own chains. Right? Because of the power of the enemy that was within him. He's breaking his own chains. He's turning around. He doesn't not wear any. This would have made the thriller video look like nothing. He was so strong, he kept breaking his chains. And they're watching all this. The disciples are learning about all this. He talks to the man and he says, Who are you? And he says, I am Legion. I don't know how it sounded, but it probably wasn't that. Like, I am Legion. Why are you Legion? Because we are many, right? He rebukes the demons. They go into the pigs. The pigs jump over the cliff. Right? And what do the people do? Instead of coming and honoring Jesus, they're like, why'd you kill our pigs? Isn't it funny how you want God to deal with things, but he can't touch your pigs? That's a message all by itself. I don't know what you call pigs in your life. I don't know what you have that you think, I got to have this stuff in order. It, let God do what God wants to do. Somebody say amen. amen. In Mark 6, 12, they go out and they preach. Uh, to the people that people should repent. They drove out many demons. These are the disciples. They're doing all this stuff because of what God was using inside of them. They anointed many people. They saw people who were sick, who were healed. They saw all these things. And that all leads us up to Mark chapter 6. Why did I say all that? Because the disciples, they knew better. They had seen God working. They had seen all the miracles. And now they're about to watch God do an incredible job with what they had. He landed, he saw a crowd, and he had compassion on them. Point number one, Jesus had compassion, and so should we. Amen. He saw a crowd, and immediately he had compassion on them. Christians just should be different. You see someone in need, you should have compassion. Yes. Non-believers, I don't know what they think, but for us, we have compassion on people that have need. He said, It says here that Jesus said, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them on many things. Verse 35 says, By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him in this remote place, and they said, 
And it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. So they're out in the country. There's no 7-Eleven. There's no grocery store. McDonald's isn't around. What are we going to do? These people have been with us for three days. I don't know about you, but sometimes I go to church and in 30 minutes I get hungry. <laughs> series of teachings and messages Amen. for you to not think about food for three days. Amen. Three days later, they're, they're hungry. They're hungry. And the disciples go to him. They say, we're in a remote place. Send the people away. Right? So they can go get something to eat. What does Jesus say? You give them something to eat. Even if I have a burrito in my pocket, it would be mine. <laughs> Hello? You give them something to eat. Right? They said to him, that would take more than a half a year's wages, they responded. How in the world are we supposed to feed all these people? We don't have the kind of money to feed them, even if there were stores that were open. <laughs> what could we do with this? He says, you give them something. You give them something. He says this, how many loaves you got? In other words, what you got? What's in your hands? Don't have much. We don't have much. Uh, here's what they say. When they, when they found what they had, they said, we got, we got five loaves, we got two fish. We got five loaves, we got two fish. The Bible says that Jesus takes that. You go down to verse 42, and it says they all ate, and they were all satisfied. Yeah. And, and I want you to picture this miracle with me, because sometimes we read the Bible, and we take some things for granted. We read the Bible, and it's like, well, that's pretty neat that that happened. Isn't that wonderful? But I want you to physically... Uh, think about what this looked like because Jesus, he takes these five loaves and he just keeps doing this, right? right. He takes the bread, he breaks the bread, and the bread multiplies. Yeah, he yeah. takes the bread, he breaks the bread, yeah. and it multiplies. Yeah. They're not bringing, right? They're not bringing bread back to him so he can keep multiplying. No. Simply with what he did, they go out and they start giving it away. Can you imagine being one of the disciples? You got a piece of bread in your hand, and you say, "Here you go," and you turn around to the next person, and there's another piece of bread in your hand. Yeah. Or, or, or do you think that they ran back to Jesus for another piece of bread? No. So, so this has to be logical, right? They, the, the, the power of multiplication is Jesus gives you something, and it just keeps multiplying in your life. And so, says they all ate until they were full. Right? right? When the bread is broken, it multiplies. Have you ever had communion in church? Yes. Yes. We take this bread that was broken. The body of Jesus has been multiplied millions and millions. You're here today because of the miracle he did with his body, which is bread. Yes. Yes. Why? How? Because he gave of what he had. Yes. He didn't ask God for something else. God, let me use what he has. <laughs> that would be awesome, right? Hey, why don't you give an offering so God can use me? It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Just give from what you have. The disciples picked up 12 basketfuls. I want you to consider that math. Five and two, and there's 12 basketfuls left over. And if it wasn't just awesome enough, it happens again in Mark. Now, now there's 4,000 people in Mark 8. It says, in those days, they were again a large crowd. Wherever you have Jesus, you're going to have large crowds. Let's fill Jesus. Let's fill our church with Jesus, and we will get large crowds. Pretty simple, right? Invite Jesus into the room and watch how people start coming. Amen. In those days, there were a very large crowd. They had nothing to eat. He, he summoned the disciples again, and he says, I have compassion on the crowd. It should have registered. Uh-oh, he's about to do this again. This is awesome. But those disciples were a lot like me. I, I, I tend to forget the miracles of the past, and I want some more right now. Amen. Hello? Amen. Oh, I'm the only one. You guys are looking. You guys are looking. This guy is crazy. He's the only. I have compassion on the crowd. It says, because they already stayed with me for three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way. And some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered him, where can we get enough bread? And so I was playing all over again. How many loaves do you have? This time he says, it's how do you know it's a different occasion? Because now they have seven. Seven. Well, shoot, he did pretty good with five. <laughs> what he can do with seven. But they're stressed out because there's people that are hungry. Then he commanded the crowd to sit down on the ground. He took seven loaves. 
He gave thanks. He broke the loaves, kept on giving them to the, to the disciples to set before the people. So they served the loaves to the crowd. Same miracle, right? Different crowd. A little bit less people. Different math. Seven loaves fed 4,000 people. They also had a few small fish. And when he had blessed them, he said, these were served as well. I have no idea how the fish multiplied. That would be cool to see though, right? They ate, the Bible says in verse 8, and they were filled. Then they collected seven large baskets of leftover pieces. How many? Seven. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. There 4,000 men. Some of them had a wife. Some of them had two wives. Don't be looking at me like that. You can't even handle the one you have. <laughs> 4,000 men were there. He dismisses them and immediately got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dal Manatha. So now it's just him. He's in the boat. How many people are with him? Disciples? How many? How many were? 12. So let's do the math. He feeds 5,000. He feeds 4,000. And now he just has his 12. Surely they knew when you hang out with Jesus, you're going to be taken care of, right? Amen. Right? Amen. But they're just like you and me. We see God do miracles in other people's lives, and you're like, well, that was me. And we forget that he's also taking care of us. Amen. Amen. It's, not, it's not just about everybody else. God, God wants to take care of you. He's not Jehovah Jireh for everyone else. He's your Jehovah Jireh. He's for you. Isn't it funny how sometimes you see God move on behalf of others, and when it comes to you, you wonder if you'll ever get your miracle. Mm -hmm. Verse 13 says, Then he left them, he got on board the boat again, and he went to the other side. They had forgotten. They had forgotten to take bread and had only one loaf. Seven fed, right? And then five fed, and I got one. How many of you know? <laughs> Jesus is with you in the boat. Give him what you got. Certainly one loaf is going to feed 12 people. Amen. But they're stressed out. What are we going to do? What are we going to eat? He, let, he leaves them. He goes, they have forgotten to take bread. Then he commanded them, watch out. Be aware of the yeast, the Pharisees. Right? He starts to say that. They were discussing among themselves that they did not have any bread. Well, they have one. Aware of this, he says to them, why are you discussing that you do not have any bread. Don't you understand or comprehend? Is your heart hardened? Do you have eyes and not see? And do you have ears and not hear? And this is what Jesus says. When I broke five loaves, 5,000 were fed, right? And you had 12 left over. When I broke seven loaves, 4,000 were fed, right? And you had seven left over. And he said to them, don't you understand yet? So many people, you, so many people, we, we look at God as a resource instead of a source. Amen. God isn't one of a list of things that you turn to. God is the very thing that you turn to. Amen. And if you have to say, Savior, listen, I, I, you need to sign up. Amen. Not to a religion, not, not to an organization. You need to sign up to a source. Yes. To a source that can make the rest of your life the best of your life. Yes. So very quickly, we'll do the math. Seven loaves feeds 4,000. Five loaves feeds 5,000. We have one. We will be fine. God's already given you enough to multiply. Whatever it is in your life that you have, just give it to him. God, I don't have much. I, I have an intellect. Give him that. Lord, I don't have much. I have this business. Give him that. And watch how he multiplies it to bless other people. So I'm going to land the plane right now. Is that all right with everybody? The simple is profound. Whenever you get an opportunity to share the word of God, just understand that the simple is always the most profound. Amen. So let Amen. me break it down simple. Number one, compassion moves Jesus and it should move us. Right? Compassion moves Jesus and it should move me. Number two, Jesus gave what he had and calls us to give what we have. Number three, Jesus can use what you have. Jesus can use what I have. He is our source. Oh, so number four, God's math is different than mine. <laughs> I love that, man. It doesn't make sense sometimes. I, I know math, but God's is different. The Lord multiplies. 
my wife is a school teacher and she taught me this. She says this all the time. Zero times whatever is always going to be zero. You got to put something in. Wow. To multiply. Wow. Amen. Amen. He's our source, not just our resource. And finally, I'm going to ask you these questions. What do you have? What can you do? And what will he do with what you have? Exodus 4.2 again. Then the Lord said, what is that in your hand? He said, I got a staff. I got a staff. I got a staff. That's all I have. How many of you know God used that? The water, it was a staff in his hand. When it was time to prove that God was with him, he put the staff on the ground and turned into a snake. That staff became something. It's all he had. All God wants to do is use what you have in your life. A friend of ours is here. As you know, you have four campuses and one of the guys is at one of the campuses and he was sharing that his daughter is in the area of Florida that was hardest hit. In fact, two of the guys on our team have family in the area of Florida that was most hit. And he shared with us last night one of the guys, his name's Ed Ivey. Ed Ivey was sharing that his granddaughter was on the phone. She was looking out and watching things float by the house. And on the phone she says to her grandma, can Jesus come fix my house? Thank you, Lord. It's a good question, right? But you've all been asking, in the midst of the storms of your own life, you've been asking, can Jesus fix my house? Can Jesus fix my relationship? Can Jesus fix my family? And the answer is, he can. He can. He can. But here is a secret that I want you to understand. Jesus will always use a believer and what a believer has in their life to be a blessing to someone else. Oh God, please bless me. But if all you say is, oh God, bless me so I can have more, you don't understand God. Amen. You pray, God, bless Amen. me so I can be a blessing. Amen. And you become a conduit of blessing instead of just a recipient of blessing. Amen. Can I pray for you? Yes. Man, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior right now, right where you are, all you got to do is confess. Hey, God, I know I'm a sinner. I can't do anything by myself. I need you. You begin to confess that Jesus died for your sin and covered it. And you believe with all your heart that he's Lord. The Bible says if you do those things, you will be saved. So if you're here today, just confess. God, I can't do it without you. I, I've tried over and over. I confess to you, Lord. You can be saved right now in Jesus' name. Just open your heart right now. Come on. Jesus, I'm here. I need you. I open my heart to you. Come and save me right now. And I'll give you whatever I have for the rest of my life. I want you to know Jesus will take you just the way you are. Yes. But he'll make your life so much better. Lord, for the rest of us, I pray right now, God, for blessings to flow through your people. Thank you, God, for what they've done already. Thank you for what they're going to do. God, thank you that we could come together at a church where we could love on one another, chip away at our faults, and grow in you. Thank you so much, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 We give God a big hand clap of praise.